Well, hey, Brian, it's uh, an honor to be here with you and have this conversation with you. And why don't we just start off with you just telling us a little bit about who you are and, and what you do? Yeah, you bet, Doug. Great to be with you. Um, yeah, my name is Brian Moran. I'm a New York Times bestselling author, and my business partner and I work with individuals and organizations to really drive higher performance. And everything we do is with really an eye towards uh, helping people execute more effectively. Doug, we figured out a long time ago that they all have great ideas. They all have resources. What matters is what you implement. And, and so that's our focus. It's been our focus for years and uh, you know, at every level. So we have people from every walks of life, virtually every industry, every business. And uh, you know, we work with people on their personal goals as well. So the, the things we're talking about are universal concepts that apply equally in your personal life as they do your business life. Yeah, in your framework, as I was mentioning before our interview, uh, I actually became aware of it because of one of our L3 community members read your book, The 12 Week Year, and reads it every year and swears by it and says it has made her, you know, 10 times more productive. And so uh, I think it's a great framework. So that's exactly what I want to dive into in our conversation. I want to actually talk about uh, two of your books. One you just came out with in December of, of 2021 called Uncommon Accountability. And can you just tell us a little bit about why did you write that book and, and what do you want readers to get out of it? Yeah, that book came about because we had, um, there's a couple chapters in the 12 week year on accountability and Michael and I, my, my co-author business partner, have a very different view of accountability. And, um, we've been working with it for a couple decades now and, and found that it's, it's not only enlightening for people, but it's incredibly powerful. And so people had asked for more and we had more to say on it. So we, uh, our publisher was asking for something. So that's the new one. Uncommon Accountability, a Radical New Approach to Greater Success and Fulfillment. And um, it's really helping under pe uh, people understand this fundamental concept that is really, I think, um, critical to live in your best life. <clears throat> and so sort of debunking what accountability is and isn't, and then helping people understand really how to apply it in a way that's powerful. Yeah. And I, I'd be curious, you know, it, it seems like you split the two into two things, one accountability on an individual level and then accountability at a, a team level or a leadership level. Talk about, and you can bring in some of the 12 week framework in here as well. Can you talk about what you found to be the best way to, to get accountability in our lives to produce the results that we're going through? You know, in L3 leadership, we have mastermind groups that meet together on a consistent basis and yeah. we try to do weekly check-in calls with an accountability partner. Um, but you lay out a framework. How, yeah. Can you just lay out that process of effectiveness? It may actually change the way we do everything in our, our mastermind. <laughs> well, first and foremost, it's, it's how you think about accountability. And most people have experienced accountability as consequences, right? I mean, everywhere you hear that word in society, it's affiliated with bad behavior, hmm. poor performance, negative consequences. And we watch the news tonight and they're going to talk about somebody who did something they weren't supposed to do. And then they're going to hold them accountable. Hmm. And, and so that's the way we experience it in society that's the prevailing view of it. And yet I think most people know intuitively that somehow accountability is important for success in life. And, and so as we looked at those concepts and, and how they played out, um, you know, our, our insight was accountability is not consequences. Um, and instead, accountability is really ownership. And it's mm -hmm. based on the concept of free will choice. The, the fact that, that we always have choice, no matter what situation we're in, we have choice. Now, we may not like the choices we have. Um, I like to joke April 15th, you got a choice to pay your taxes <laughs> or go to prison, right? And yep. I, personally, I don't care for either of them, but, but you have choice. And so it's that recognition of that choice and then taking ownership of those choices in, in the areas of life that matter. And typically when we're struggling in an area, it, it has to do with a lack of ownership, right? We're waiting for someone or something to change. And so when we take ownership of those situations, we take ownership of our choices, uh, it creates different outcomes. And so from a leader standpoint, how you think about accountability then affects how you engage your people, right? Every organization we've worked in, we've heard people talk about holding others accountable in you know, I would, I would argue you can hold a bag of groceries or a baby, but, but when we're talking about holding someone accountable, when we really look into that, it's really about creating a negative consequence when they don't do what we want them to do. And, and that's not accountability, that's consequences. And, and consequences play a role, um, but you never get discretionary effort with negative consequences. You get just enough to stop the consequences. So, so how you think about accountability affects everything from your health and your relationships 
um, your income, your career, your fulfillment, um, whether you're a solopreneur, whether you're just applying it in your personal goals or whether you're leading an organization. So on the individual level, because I want to hit both of these, I believe in the 12 week, you had actually have a weekly agenda for holding ourselves accountable or, you know, for ownership. Is your recommend? Can you run us through that agenda? And you know, what yeah. would your it was your recommendation to do that with uh, an accountability partner every week, a team? You know, what would your encouragement be? Yeah, so we talk about a weekly accountability meeting uh, where you're meeting with a few peers, just talking about how you're doing against your goals, and most importantly, around your actions, um, because we control the actions, not the outcomes. And and so, how well you know the twelve week year is all about execution. As I said earlier, it's not it's not enough to know, right? You've you've got to implement, and and so that conversation with your peers is really more about the activity, the execution, than it is the outcomes. Um, but but having those conversations, those candid conversations with a few other people once a week, again creates accountability, self, and some encouragement and some challenge from others. Um, that said, though, there have to be some things in place, right? You have to. Your, your goals have to be connected to some motivation, right? Your, your why, your longer term vision. Um, you also need to be very clear on the actions, um, which, which requires a tactical plan, not a conceptual plan. And, and most individuals, most organizations plan conceptually, not tactically. And so, you know, in order for those conversations to be meaningful and impactful, there are some, there's some supporting structures that need to be in place. So, yeah, when it comes to actions, I think that's really, really incredible. So if I'm meeting with, if I'm meeting with you and I say, Hey, I want to, I want to lose 10 pounds in the next 12 weeks, you know, what, so would you recommend me saying, okay, the actions I'm going to take there, I'm going to work out five times a week. I'm going to eat healthy five, at least five or six days out of the week. And then those accountability calls would just be, Hey, did you work out those five days? Did you, whether it's, and if we looked at another subject sales, did you make the five sales calls? Is that how you would structure it and have the, the questions asked of you in that meeting? Yes. Yeah, so, so with the 12 week year, one of the things um, that we do is we track the results, but we score the execution. So if you're on the 12 week year, you're actually going to score your execution on a weekly basis. And again, the reason we do that is because that's the most powerful lead indicator you have. It's, it's the greatest predictor of your future success. You know, did I do the things I said I need to do in order to accomplish the goal? And so in a, in a, in a weekly accountability group, we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about how we're doing against the goal. So if it's a weight loss, you know, and I want to lose 12 pounds over the next 12 weeks, I'm two weeks in, where am I at? I've gained two pounds. I've lost two pounds, whatever, whatever it is, right? Um, if it's sales and I'm going to do 120,000 or 120 million in the next 12 weeks, right? Where am I at against that goal? And then also how well did I execute or how poorly did I execute the prior week? Um, and so that'll be a score, but it also then you dig into, are there certain actions that you're not taking, that you're avoiding, that you're finding difficult? Um, and if so, what's going to be different this week? And, and so if that's at the individual level, is it the exact same thing, you know, within an organization and holding your team accountable? You know, my, during the day, I work at uh, Light of Life Rescue Mission. We're a nonprofit in, in Pittsburgh. So I've been in the nonprofit space for a long time. Yeah. And I, I've found that in nonprofit space, a lot of nonprofits struggle with this idea of accountability because then in the business world, I feel like they're very ruthless on accountability. Can you talk about the best way leaders can utilize yeah. accountability within their teams? Yeah. And so neither one of those work, by the way. When you say they're very ruthless in the business world, it's the same thing. They're ruthless with consequences. That's not creating accountability. In, in fact, the more ruthless you are, the more it damages the relationship, the more uh, resentment it creates, the, the more uh, sabotage it creates and passive resistance it creates. And yet that's the way leaders have been taught to manage, right? You really get, a, get after your people when they're not performing. And so, I mean, think about, think about yourself and the last time someone did that to you, you don't come away feeling inspired to give your best. You want to give just enough to get that person to go away. And that's the problem with the consequence model. And when you talk about holding someone accountable, that's what we're talking about. And, and so we talk about scrub that notion, forget that, hold people capable. And it, and it sounds like, well, that sounds semantics. It's not. It, it's subtly different, but at the same time, profoundly different in that it's based on the understanding that I can't force someone to do something, hmm. right? If you think about the way big organizations hold people accountable, it's with this notion that I can force you to do something. 
when in truth I can't. I might create a consequence that's so distasteful that you choose to do it, but that's where all that collateral damage comes in. And that's what you have in most companies. Um, or, or you get the opposite, which is kind of what you said in nonprofit is I find that so distasteful because I have volunteers. I don't feel like I can do that. So I don't confront at all. Right. And, and so accountability uh, as ownership is still from a leader standpoint is still very confrontive, but it's not confrontive with consequences. First It's confronted with personal freedom and personal choice. Cause whether I'm a volunteer in your organization or whether I'm a W2 employee, I don't have to work there. I can choose to work somewhere else. And so <clears throat> as a leader, what I'm going to do, Doug, is when you're underperforming, I'm going to confront you with the fact that there are performance standards. I'm not going to lower the standard for you, but it's your choice whether or not you want to perform to that standard or not. And, <clears throat> and the consequences of you choosing to not perform are, con are a set of consequences that you're choosing, which are going to be some sort of up to termination. Right. It's just not a good fit. Doesn't make you a bad person, <laughs> makes you a bad fit. On the other hand, if you if you choose to perform, there's a different set of consequences that follow that. Everything from recognition, bonuses, incentive pay, all kinds of, you know, maybe even promotion. But in the end, you know, as a leader, what I want to do is I want to confront you with your choice. Otherwise, what happens is, is the burden to perform becomes mine as the leader, which is which is not good. I mean, because it's, it's your burden to perform, not mine. My job is just to help you and, and help you confront the reality of how you're doing and hold up a mirror and, and give you some coaching when you need it. But ultimately, you have to choose to do the things to be successful in the organization or not. And so in the end, you choose your consequences. And, and again, it's subtle, but it's profoundly different. It changes the conversation. It changes the relationship. It changes the results. And is what you just shared pretty much that conversation you would have with an employee who may not be performing or, you know, yeah, with, very, is that with very, accountability? Yeah. Very similar to that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That was beautiful. Um, I want to talk a little bit, dive into more on how to be effective through the 12 week year. Again, I think this is brilliant. The book's called the 12 week year and the tagline is how to get more done in 12 weeks than most do in a year, which is awesome. So talk about that book. Why did you write this book? And can people really get more done in 12 weeks than a year? Yeah. So it's interesting. We were, um, we'd been working with our clients on it and we were all going to a trade show as a vendor, Michael and I, and, and uh, so kind of wondering what we were going to pass out and hand out at the booth. And we decided to write a, a just a short format book, leave out all the fluff. And that was the precursor of the 12 week year. It was called periodization 12 weeks to breakthrough. And so we went down to Kinko's and self-published, right? We printed a hundred books, sold them for 10 bucks a pop, <laughs> gave a few away. And from that sold a couple hundred thousand copies of that book. It, wow. it literally changed our business, changed our life. And, and the crazy thing, Doug, was we wrote it in 12 weeks. <laughs> so, so, um, but then Wiley came along, big publisher out of New York and said, Hey, they wanted to publish it, uh, gave us an opportunity to expand it. And so it was really just documenting what we were doing with our clients and, Early on, we started working with our clients specifically around what it takes to execute at a high level. And we figured out there's a set of disciplines and principles to do that. Um, but we were doing it in the context of an annual environment because that's what everybody does, right? We set annual goals. We broke them down quarterly, monthly, and weekly. Same thing with the plans. And, you know, we got good results, but we just felt like there was more. And we came across the concept of periodization, which was an athletic training process. And it had some some tenants in it that we were able to extract and apply to a business setting and a personal setting. And, and one of those pieces was a shorter time frame, And so the, the 12 week year was created. Um, and so our clients work in the context of every 12 weeks as a year. And there aren't, there aren't four of those in the year that's annualized thinking, right? It's all about mindset, getting out of that wow. mindset that I can catch up. That's the problem with the annual environment. And people say, what's different with 90-day planning or quarterly planning? Well, a quarter is a fourth of a whole. And that's the mindset that we got to get away from. Because you may catch up and hit the goal, but you can't recapture capacity you left on the table last week, last month, last quarter. And that's the difference between where people are performing what they're capable of. So, so you asked, is it possible for people to accomplish in 12 weeks what they would in 12 months? And we have thousands that are, have done it and are doing it. Uh, and it's not about working harder. It's not about working longer. It's not about taking everything you would do in 12 months and trying to cram it into 12 weeks. It's really being clear on the things that matter most. 
and then being more consistent with them. And as we do that, it not only creates momentum and brings results online quicker, but it also reduces the stress. And so let's start to break that down. You know, one of the the functions you talk about in the book is just vision and why vision is so important. You just mentioned getting crystal clear on what matters most. What have you found about vision? And yeah, you talk in the book about an aspirational vision and then having a three-year vision. What would your encouragement be to leaders today when it comes to vision to getting clear on what matters most? Yeah, the biggest thing is most leaders have probably worked on their departmental vision or their company vision. That's not where we start. Cause that's just part of my life. That's not my, so we start with what do you want in your life? And we do that with everyone on the team, whether they're full-time or part-time um, regardless of what their title or status is. And, and you know, what do you want your life to look like five, 10, 15 years in the future? What do you want it to look like three years from now? Uh, because that's the why. And, and um, then we look at the, the business or the career and say, okay, what do we need to do here in this department or this organization that helps you live that life so that we connect the dots for the people about what they do Monday through Friday and how it helps them accomplish what they want in life. Uh, and that's really how you get an empowered, inspired workforce is connecting those dots where people see that, okay, I can do these calls, right, to, so that I can have this success here in my role. Why? So that I can live the life I want to live from a, from a material standpoint, from a, a confidence self-image standpoint, you know, from a family standpoint, all of that stuff matters. And, and so that vision, most people never do that work. The top performers sort of do it intuitively if they haven't done it on paper. Um, but the real opportunity is to take people through it and get some clarity around that so that they can connect the dots and see how, how it fits. And in some cases it doesn't fit and people move on and that's good for everyone. Yeah. And once you have it, you said you talked about getting it down on paper. What do you encourage people to do once they have their vision in front of them? Should they review it, you know, annually, although I guess you discard that thinking, but review it every 12 weeks, every day. What do, what do yeah. Annually for us would be every 12 weeks, but yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the key is, you know it, Doug, the key is staying connected to it, right? Whether it's daily or at least once a week, but staying connected to it. I've got a little reminder in my outlook to connect with it daily. And I've got mine printed on a three by five card, the aspirational on one side, the three year on the other. And so some days I read the whole thing. Some days I'll just pick an item or two and sort of mentally stand that ground, right? What's that enable me to do when I'm there that I can't do now, right? The more the more I mentally live into it, the easier it is for me to take action on it and and, and really lean into it. Yeah. And then, so you take your vision. Now you have this aspirational vision, the three-year vision, and then your encouragement is to break it down into 12 week goal, 12 week goals. Can you talk to us about the process of goal setting and getting clear on the next 12 weeks? Yeah. One of the challenges there is most people take on too much and partly because <laughs> they're doing annual plans, right? So it's like, Hey, 12 months is a big span of time. And so one of the first things there is really deciding um, what kind of capacity you have to execute against goals. And so is one goal enough? Is is two enough? When you start to get more than three in any one area, like your business, you're probably setting yourself up to struggle. Um, so you know, in an ideal world, what we would say, if it's your first 12-week year, one business or career goal, one personal goal. And And the reason, Doug, is because we all have limited capacity. We have limited time. We have limited energy. We have limited intellect. It's not a slam. It's just a reality. And and every time we take on one more thing, it really reduces the probability of us being great at anything pretty significantly. And, and, and so the 12 week year is really about being great at a few things versus being mediocre at a lot of things. Yeah. And you, you made a statement in the book that there always be more opportunities than you can effectively pursue, which is basically what you just said. Can you tell me the framework you give leaders or how you personally decide what to say yes to and what to say no to in your life? Because as you said, I always throw way too much on my plate and that's an incredibly challenging area of my life. So yeah. Now. Yeah. It's one of the hardest things. I mean, we we find ourselves falling into that same trap and we've been doing this and we wrote the book on it. So, <laughs> you know, just recognize that that's normal. Um, but again, um, you know, the, the, the success in life comes through focus. And so what if we just picked one or two areas and really nailed it? What might be different 12 weeks from now? Now we do that over a couple of 12 week years and it literally is life changing. And, and so the process of sorting through is really thinking about all the things I might take on as goals and just prioritize them. 
if I could only do one, which one would that be? If I could only do one more, okay, let's just stop there. And if we did that, would we be celebrating at the end of 12 weeks? Because sometimes we, we throw all these goals in to hedge our bets. And, and by doing that, we're, we're almost ensuring that we're not going to be successful on any of it because we're spread too thin. Uh, and, and so the, the challenge is, and it is a challenge, but on the front end to really think about, okay, if I could only do one of these things, you know, which one would be most critical in terms that's aligned with my vision, my three-year vision, my aspirational vision, um, and, and keeping it to three or less is ideal. Okay, so now, uh, you know, a leader has their vision. They just set their 12-week goals for the first time. Now it actually, okay, that's all nice to have on paper, but now it's actually time to execute. Talk to us about process. Talk to us about time management and taking those 12-week goals and actually executing on those day-to-day. How do, how do people optimize their day-to-day execution? Yeah, one of those things is, and I sort of touched on this earlier, you've got to get tactical at the plan, Right. Most plans are conceptual. If you don't get tactical, it's going to be really difficult for you to execute it because concepts don't execute. Right. In sales, referrals, great concept, cross sell, great concept, exercise, diet, great concepts. Those don't execute. And so you've got to get really granular and, and tactical. Once you do that, though, you know what's what matters most for the next 12 weeks. And with the 12 week year, all tactics, all actions have due dates and they're by weeks. So some are one time tactics. Like if I'm trying to lose weight, I'm going to order superfoods, you know, in week one. Um, I don't need to order them every week or order them one time. I, a second tactic, though, is to take my superfoods daily every, every day. That's, that's an ongoing tactic. And so that shows up when, when, we, when we put the due dates by week, then what happens is it creates a cadence for us that says, here's what's due this week. And by default, it, it's what matters most. This is how it reduces your stress because – um, not everything's equal in terms of activity. And, and so you now know what matters most. This is how you win the week. You start with that, that, that weekly plan, if you will, which is a one twelfth slice of the 12 week plan. It doesn't contain everything you do in your job. Um, it's just the things do this week from the 12 week plan, but by default, that's the most important stuff. So that's what you build your week around. That's what you time block around. That's what you're checking into daily so that at the end of the week, you've got those activities completed. Um, and there will be all kinds of things that pull you off course. That's why it needs to be written. It, a plan between your ears versus a plan written are two very different beasts. Right? I saw one study that says even if you know what you need to do, if you write it down, the probability of you doing it is 80% higher. That's huge. That's not a little bit. And so that's why you know, we, we, we subscribe to a 12-week written plan. And then that weekly plan is not something I create from scratch every week. It's just sort of picking out of that 12 week plan. What's due this particular week. And that is what drives my week. And you mentioned time blocking. I'm, I'm curious how often, how much of your, you know, daily to-do list is just written on, you know, I use the full focus planner, but in a planner somewhere versus how much of your, your action items actually get put on the calendar. For time blocking. So there's a difference between a weekly plan and a to-do list. I have a to-do list. I, I have a clear plastic holder that has my weekly, has my 12 week plan on one side, has my weekly plan on the other. I have a separate to-do list in the middle. The to-do list is all the, um, I would call it kind of mid-level, lower level stuff. The 12 week plan is what drives my week. And so that's what I calendarize. I make sure when I pull that thing at the beginning of the week, um, you know, we have software, so I just go in and I, I just print it out and then I calendarize that stuff. So if this is what's most important this week, when's it happening? And then I let the rest of the week fill in around it, all the other to do's, if you will, knowing that I'm going to get to the end of the week and some of that stuff's not going to be done because there's always going to be more to do than you have time. To do. But that's okay because the big rocks got done. The plan items got done. So I treat my 12 week plan, my weekly plan and my to-do list very differently. My to-do list, if I get to it, fine. My, my weekly plan is what drives my week. And then let's talk about measurement. I think that's so good. So we have our weekly plan. It drives our week. We have our big rocks. They're time blocked. Uh, let's talk about review. How do you actually measure whether or not you accomplished what you want to accomplish? And then how do you plan ahead for the week ahead? What do you do in between weeks? 
Yeah, so there's an after action review after every week. I do mine Monday morning first thing. And that is first thing I do is I go back and I score my execution of the things that were due, what got done. You know, was I consistent with it? And uh, and then I'm going to look at the results I got as well. And so, you know, I score the execution, I track the results. And in those two numbers is everything I need to know. Because if, if there's a breakdown... In other words, I'm not, I'm not on track with my results. It's one of two areas. It's either in the plan itself. I don't have the right tactical plan or it's in the execution. I'm just not doing it. And guess where it is most of the time? <laughs> execution. Yeah. Right. Probably 80, 90% of the time, but most people want to change the plan partly because it's easier and partly because they don't have a way to pinpoint the breakdown. That's why we score the execution, track the results. And so you'll know where the breakdown is on a weekly basis and you'll never go more than 12 weeks before you stop the world and do a, a significant after action review and learn from it and, and lock and load for the next 12 weeks. So that weekly cadence is starting out with a weekly plan that defines what matters most for the week, blocking those activities in my calendar, meeting with a couple of peers and what we call a wham. And then at the end of that week, go back and assess my, my outcomes and my actions. But most importantly, my actions, because that's what I can control. Did I did I execute at a high enough level? And, and by the way, Doug, with thousands of people on the system, what we found is you don't need to be perfect. If you're averaging about 80 percent on the execution week in and week out, in most cases, you'll accomplish the goals. And that's true for individuals. It's true co collectively for teams as well. So you, you kind of alluded to this already, but. What do you do when you start getting close to that 12th week? What does the transition look like from one 12-week period to the next? Well, we take a 13th week, and that's the week where we really um, carve out some time. We go, we take our team off-site. We go for a day and a half, and the first half of day one is a, a, a review of the past 12 weeks, right? What worked, what didn't work, where were we on, where were we off, what's changed in the marketplace, what can we learn from that? It's, and even if we've had a really rough 12-week year, it's never about beating ourselves up because we can't change the past, but we can learn from it. So, so what is, what is the data telling us? How well did we execute? What if we had executed a little better? Um, what do we know now that we didn't in week five or week two or week one when we set the plan, right? Um, and then we'll take that learning and we'll, we'll reconnect with the vision and then we'll lock and load for the next 12 weeks. So we'll set the goals and build the plan for the next 12 weeks. So part of that cadence is every 13th week, we're reviewing the past 12 weeks. We're locking and loading for the next 12 weeks. And then important piece, we celebrate the progress hmm. and celebrate the success, which especially as an organization, you know, the 12 week year provides you a lot more opportunities to do that. And, and what you celebrate creates energy, creates focus, creates culture. And, and so you've got more opportunities to do that. And, and sometimes, you know, it's been a tough 12 weeks and there's not a lot of success to celebrate, but there's progress nonetheless to celebrate. What are, have you seen any really unique ways or great ways for individuals or teams to celebrate that, that really energize people? Yeah, individuals, it's all over the board, right? Because sometimes it's, it's just, um, you know, buying something that, that um, you wanted and you sort of set that out as a carrot and, and then you celebrate with, with that purchase. For, for teams, it's usually some type of activities. Um, it can be, we, we've seen teams do paintball. We've seen them do cruises. We've seen them do all kinds of fun stuff. And, and so usually what we tell people, look, if you're not the creative one, find, find the party <laughs> person on your team and let them plan the celebration because they'll come up with something every 12 weeks that's fun and it's exciting and, and that people really uh, enjoy. Yeah. Well, before we dive into the lightning round, obviously people aren't going to just be able to execute on, on the 12 week year just from listening to this podcast, but maybe you whetted their appetite. I know you've developed a lot of resources. You talked about, you work with organizations through this, this framework, where can people find you? And if they want to take a next step or get access to some of the resources you created, where can they go? Yeah. 12 year.com. Um, and if you want, you can go 12 year.com forward slash getting started and you'll get three emails from me. That's kind of a getting started course to get you going with this. Um, but that's what you can find. We do everything from, you know, online training to individual one-on-one -on -one coaching. Anything else you want to say about the book or accountability? Um, the other place is Uncommon Accountability. You know, you can find that book, um, some, some resources on that site. That book's available at all the booksellers. 
And um, yeah, that's about it. All right. And we'll include links to all of that in the show notes. And so now it's time to dive into the lightning round. Just a bunch of fun questions that I ask in every interview. And the first one is, what is the best advice you've ever received and who gave it to you? Well, so I I had worked for this gentleman. We were a billion dollar company. He and his brother owned it. And it was one of many they owned. And they owned high rise buildings. They were developing an island in Florida and stuff like that. And I remember asking him you know, what he thought was the, uh, the one characteristic that contributed to his success the most. And he said, you know, Brian, I recover well. Hmm. He said, everybody gets knocked down. I get up faster. And, and that's been a great piece of advice because right. It's all mindset. He had a much different mindset. Most people are surprised when it doesn't work out. He was like, I'm expecting it, you know, and, and he was up faster and after it. If you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'd have to think about that one a little bit. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a lot of things that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm spirit based. So it'd probably be something around that. Okay. You know? Yeah. What's the, the best purchase you've made in the last year for a hundred dollars or less? Best purchase I've made for a hundred dollars or less. Um, we've made a ton of purchases because we recently moved, but very few of them were a hundred dollars or less. <laughs> um, I, it'd probably be a book I bought, you know, I mean, I can't, I can't think of anything else that would, uh, you know, it's not a pair of shoes or something like that. So, yeah, well, that's my yeah. next question. So what's a book either recently or all time that's made a significant impact on your life that you would recommend everyone to read? You know, the book I, I really love, um, it's called Field of Fear and Do It Anyways. It's a short little book by Dr. Susan Jeffers. It was out of print for a while. I think it's back in print. Um, but she just did some research on, you know, successful people versus everyone else and, and found that successful people still have fear and anxiety when they're trying new things, but they don't let it stop them. And so it's just a really powerful book, again, around mindset. You're an author and it sounds like almost an accidental author, right? You self-published and didn't know it would blow up and now you're everywhere. Um, what would you, what advice would you give to aspiring authors and what is, is being an, uh, an author done for you? Being an author has, has d- done a ton. I mean, we're in 15 languages. It's taken me around the world and created some amazing experiences and things like that. Um, my advice would be that, you know, 80, I think 82, 83% of at least Americans would like to write a book. Most of them won't. Don't be one of the ones that don't, right? Um, we wrote ours in 12 weeks. So don't worry about getting it perfect. Schedule time each day. Um, separate the starting from finishing. And what I mean by that is, is if you're going to write for an hour or two every day, don't put pressure on yourself to write an entire chapter, or whatever. If you write a paragraph, you write a paragraph. If, if you write 10 pages, you write 10 pages, right? Just sit down and write and, and schedule that, block that out and do it consistently and you know, if you haven't written before, don't worry about getting it right the first time. Just get it out on paper. What makes for a good book is when you go back and you edit it. That's where the real, where the real book is written is in the editing by you. And so just get, get in the process of writing every day or in these, in these periodic blocks and you'll have that thing done before you know it. Hmm. There's, by the way, we have 12 week year for writers. There's a whole book we have out on that. We, Uh um, we teamed up with a professor who actually came to us and said, Hey, I'm putting this book together on how to write a book. And I want to use the 12 years of framework because it works so effectively for me. So that is out there as well. 12 week year for writers. So that'd be my best advice. Get that book. It gives you a process and walks you through it. Did you, did you write the, the book in 12 weeks intentionally or did that just happen in that coincidentally? It happened because that's the time we had by the time we decided to do it and get to the show. We had about 12 weeks and it was coming up and we're like, okay, we got to crank through this thing. And so it was perfect, right? That's why, that's why deadlines matter. That's how the 12 week year works, right? There's a, there's a deadline there, a hard line in the sand that you say, Hey, I'm going to measure my success or failure. And, and it causes you to behave differently. What are you dreaming about right now? You know, we're, um, we've been very blessed. I'm big on family. And um, so we, we've just moved, but our, our, um, our goals, our vision is to really scale our company, expand it more to have a bigger impact. We've just, um, we've been doing coaching for a long time. We've launched accountability groups. 
um, with our unique view and they're super powerful. So we're looking at, you know, scaling that big time. Uh, you get to spend time with a lot of leaders. I'm curious when you get a uh, one-on-one or a dinner with a great leader, do you have a go-to question or two that you always ask? You know, I, I'm, I'm always interested in a couple things. One is their value system, because I think that that overrides everything we do. It, mm. it, it, it shapes the way we think it shapes the way we act. And so I'm always interested in their value system. And then I'm also interested in their, the struggles, right? What was the biggest challenge or struggle that they faced and how they overcame it? Um, because I do, you know, successes are great. I'm not sure we learn from the successes as much as we learn from the the challenges and and some of the failures, even. So, can you answer both of those for me? Let's start with the the struggle. What's a struggle you've had that you had to overcome, and what did you learn from it? I had I had a number of different struggles. Right, my wife and I are both cancer survivors, so we've had health struggles. We've we've had financial struggles in that when when the uh, when we hit that recession, we had. Um, we were working with big corporations and we we're very small companies. So we only had uh, a handful of those in process and they, they all put it on hold. They all dried up. Hmm. And so, and that selling cycle on those things because they're big organizations was about 18 months. And so we, we literally lost everything and had to decide, were we going to continue on this route? Um, or, or were we going to do something different? And we made the decision to continue, but to pivot, right? So we, we pivoted and within, I, I don't know, 18, 24 months, my income was higher than it had ever been. So wow. it was, uh, it was quite the experience. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sign up to go through it again. <laughs> um, Cause it was, it was brutal at times, um, but learned a ton in it as well, you know? And can you talk about your value system? I'd be curious to hear more. Well, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm spiritual based. So, yeah. you, you know, for me, my worldview is, is God and Christ at the center. And <clears throat> so that shapes everything I do and the decisions I make. And it's why family is so important to me. It's why having an impact is so important to me um, and, and making a difference. And, and so, you know, my routines are based on starting the morning with, with scripture and some quiet time. And then, um, you know, also prayer throughout the day. And I, I'm, a, I'm a believer as well. I'd just be curious, have you always been a person of faith or did that come when you were older? Yeah, for, I grew up in a family that um, Catholic and, um, you know, my mom and dad taught us to believe in God, taught us um, why God existed um, and, and um, you know, the character of God. And so, yeah, I grew up with that. It got much more personal, though, um, after college as my wife and I, you know, we've, we we uh, ended up in a different church and got in a small group and really grew a lot. Started actually, Doug started reading the Bible <laughs> and yeah, yeah. <laughs> because growing up, I wasn't really encouraged to do that. And that that's what changed for me is getting into the scripture and God's word and really understanding it and um, and making sense of it for me in my own life. If you uh, if you've crossed and I don't know if you have a bucket list, but what's an experience that you've done or crossed off your bucket list that you think everyone should experience uh, before they die? You know, what's a fun experience. And um, so we have horses, we have Arabian show horses, but if you've never been on a horse at a full gallop, it's a great feeling. It okay. is an amazing feeling. You, you have to you wear a cowboy hat? Path, something that's level and just let the full rain out and go. It's a hoot. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. And do you have an item left on your bucket list that you want to do before you die? Yeah, well, there's a lot of stuff. You know, my wife and I, um, we love to travel. We want to do a lot more travel. I, um, I've got a daughter getting married <clears throat> this summer. My younger one is is still in high school, so looking forward to grandkids. Now, I don't, I don't have a lot of control over that, but that is <laughs> that is on on the bucket list. Um, but a lot of a lot of it is around travel and um, just doing stuff with friends. Okay, and then last two questions: If you could go back and have coffee with yourself at any age. Uh, what age would that be? And what would you tell yourself that you think would have made a difference if you would have listened? A lot of people are like, Hey, I would have told myself yeah. that, but I wouldn't have listened, but I'd be curious. Yeah. I don't think I would have listened, but, but, um, you know, it'd been, been in my teenage years to just, you know, especially in teenage years, you're so self-absorbed to, to really realize that it's, it's not about you. It's about contributing and serving others. And, um, so the more, the, the more I learn that, the more I employ that the richer life gets. 
And then on the other end of your life, looking back, what do you want to be remembered for? What do you want your legacy to be? Um, really about a, a, just a godly man, great husband, great father. Those are the important things to me. Um, having an impact. You know, the, 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 the beauty of the 12 week year in writing the book is it's, it's impacted millions of people, which is um, something I had hoped to do. Wasn't sure it would happen, but it, it's been, it's been an amazing thing. And so, you know, that's what our business is about today is having an impact, making a difference. So, you know, when my dad died um, at his wake, my dad was an electrician and a uh, really great guy. Um, but there were people at, at his funeral and at his wake that I had never met. Hmm. And I remember this one kid, uh, not kid, young man um, in tears. And I had never met him. He said, you know, your dad was my hero. And, and that's the kind of impact my dad had. Wow. Um, you know, just doing what he did, being who he was, being, being the kind of man that he was. And, and so to me, that's a life well lived. And anything else you want to leave leaders with today? Yeah, I, I, you know, for, for me as a leader, I think you have a responsibility and obligation to be the best leader you can be. And the way the organization grows is you grow as a leader. If you're not growing as a leader, it's tough to grow the organization. And, and so, you know, my advice to, to leaders is just grow. Do everything you can to grow. Um, lead the way with that. Encourage your people. You know, when I joined PepsiCo, my regional manager gave me a book to read. And it, and it, it changed the course of, of my life in terms of got me fired up about leadership. I became a student of it, um, started to apply the stuff. It's why I do what I do today. And so, you know, as a leader, you're probably leading, hopefully, for impact. Yeah. Not for prestige or power. If you're leading for prestige or power, you know, go do something else. Um, but if you're leading for impact, right, role model that. Walk that out. Engage people in, in, um, in their growth and in your growth. And I have to ask as we close, what, what was the book that your manager gave you? One Minute Manager. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Sorry if I missed it's that. It's like a thousand years old, but yeah, <laughs> a simple little book. But you know what happened was, Doug, I read it and I started to apply it. And it had an impact. It worked. And I went, yeah. wow. And that's when I started just starting to consume everything I could on leadership and high performance. Yeah. Well, thank you for what you've contributed to the high performance world. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for all of your work. And I look forward to more work in the future. Thanks for your time today. Thanks for adding value to me and all the leaders that are listening to this. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Doug. Absolutely.